So we have heard from uh, the introductions and the, um, uh, the backgrounds of the people sitting around the table, there are numerous interests and numerous um, uh, starting points or ways to, to connect to um, uh, issues of, of water, of, of community, of access. Um, and, and so uh, the range of disciplinary interests I find quite fascinating. And in terms of the work that I've been doing with curriculum, it really speaks to this notion of interdisciplinarity. And some folks use the term transdisciplinarity. Um, but in some ways, when we're interested in, in key issues, social issues, those disciplines go away. It's about people. It's about, it's about something beyond science or beyond art or beyond um, uh, whatever that discipline might be. Uh, so our multiple areas of expertise really come into play quite nicely here. This year, um, not only uh, do I uh, have the pleasure to uh, uh, and the good fortune to, to be able to visit three times here at MIT as a, M MIT as a visiting uh, artist. But I'm also a visiting artist and visiting learner at a local elementary school back home. And I'm essentially, people were asking me, what are you doing at MIT and what are you doing at the elementary school? And I said, I'm doing the same thing. Yeah. And the key is, I, I'm going, I'm, I want to know um, at the elementary school specifically what they can teach me about what I think I know about what I'm doing. And that's what we're doing here, too. I, I'm, I'm eager to learn about what you can teach me about what I think I'm doing, but also what we can teach each other, what we can learn from each other. Quite often in some educational spaces, um, uh, administrators, teachers, um, other uh, folks in, in various levels of, of making decisions forget, explicitly or otherwise, that learners bring knowledge with them to every single learning con context. So there's as much learning going on uh, in one direction as there are in multiple directions. So we all have valuable information to share. So I'm, I'm eager to have that conversation. So it's about the filters, right? It's about um, how these, these, these ceramic water filters inspire multiple curriculum possibilities. It's not just a curriculum or, or instructional possibilities for how do you make the filter and how do you use them, but there are other other ripples, uh, pardon the pun, right? There are other ways that the, um, uh, the filters might inspire uh, learning. Uh, for example, the filters are designed to sit inside a, a plastic water receptacle like the one you see here and the, and the one you saw in the video. But what if you asked uh, artists to create a ceramic receptacle in their own style? If you gave them the specifications and they created the vessel in their own style, and then you could actually have an exhibition of these receptacles. And that exhibition could tour to different locations. And in doing so, you could promote the exhibition, but you could also then talk about the global water crisis. You could talk about that lack of adequate access to, to water. You could talk about the ways that artists and other folks are engaging in work uh, to, to respond to these issues. Anytime, and, and so the, these, uh, these exhibitions um, uh, went on for a number of years. Uh, my colleagues and I were talking about reviving this, this practice. The idea is if someone purchases one of the receptacles, that money essentially is a donation back to a water project. This is a vessel that I created as part of that work. And it's inspired by the sanitation workers' strike in 1968. I am a man. And it relates in many ways to uh, found object art, assemblage uh, work uh, from some of the modernist artists. Uh, that's a top of a trophy I found at a secondhand store. The guy with the little fedora, it was perfect, right? And I made these little uh, signs. But the idea being, how can the work of art itself function as a, a, a way to speak out and speak back to social issues? Uh, inspired by, this one was inspired by the water filters and water filter receptacles. So um, those links become, inter, uh, become entangled, but they also allow for other trajectories of, of thinking to happen. Well, we can talk about protest. We can talk about, well, what is a basic human need? What is a human right? What is, what is privilege? What, are you, what, do you, what do you need and what do you want? Those are two different things. And I think those kinds of conversations with students are quite powerful. Who has access? Who, who sets up the limitations? What is necessary? Who takes action? Right? These kinds of questions, I think, are central to not only a curricu curricula within education, within art 
or within education, but also curricula within the various disciplines that are represented around this table. I'm leaving on the 13th um, to go to Puerto Rico uh, to, to central mountain town, Sidra, um, to bring you know, solar lamps, water filters, and solar panels, and solar panel kits um, to a certain sector of, um, of a barrio in, in Sidra. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the idea of like, you know, a filter that you know, fits in a luggage, right? Because I'm limited to what I can personally carry, three 50-pound mm -hmm. bags right. and paying $75 for the third one, two free, whatever. Um, to do that, because uh, the bothersome part, for me, who this is not my background, I don't, I don't know. So we have rechargeable batteries at home that we've been very true to. Like, we only use our rechargeable batteries. Sure. That's as far as that goes with us, but um, and then the filter water inside it, but um, water's basically good. But seeing all these shipments of bottled water mm -hmm. and the request for batteries mm -hmm. in an island and just the waste that that will create, um, and uh, and that no one thinks about, um, and how can at least in one corner of the world, uh, or in this case that island, um, can you know. We try to do something because, you know, I talk to my family and they go to the river and that's where they bathe and that's where they get water to clean and clean and bathe, that's it. Mm -hmm. Because they won't drink it because they don't know if something died Absolutely. further up mountain and and um, and they don't have, you know, access to that. And then there's sun everywhere, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so just that immediate thing and... and um, it's called Sector Bloquera because at the bottom of the hill there's a huge um, hardware type of like, como se dice ferreteria, like, you know, just like a lumber yard type mm -hmm. of thing. So when you say sawdust, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I can easily get, <laughs> I can get tons of sawdust um, um, from lo ete, from my, ay, so lo berrios. But, um, but yeah, that, that, um, the access uh, and, um, and how, you know, in a limited time frame, can one, you know, as I look at that little one right there, mm -hmm. um, just to, just to do that, right? Because, um, right, and that uh, weighs nothing. Right? It weighs nothing. Yeah. So, so I guess that's my, of this, and and then I I see. Um, Ujisko, like who has Hartford, I'm from Hartford, so he has Hartford roots, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know it, it, Dred Scott, like you know it, it's it's a really exciting presentation and and um, contextualizes it really incredibly, uh, but this really drew me because of the immediacy of, of what's happening down there. Absolutely, so, yeah. yeah. Well, um, you know what we're seeing uh, in Puerto Rico right now is is just. For me, it's beyond words, beyond adjectives. I can't, it's, it's indescribable. I, I spoke with a, fr a friend of mine, a colleague and friend of mine, a few days ago. His family is in uh, Puerto Rico, and he says it's, you know, he, he talked about, before we heard the reports in the news about the gas issues and the water issues, he told me about both of those. Uh, I also appreciate your comment um, about, you know, sending water bottles and batteries, and that just creates more waste. It's helpful, but unless you think about what happens beyond the life of that material that's being irresponsible at some level, right? So the rechargeable, the recyclable, the renewable um, is important. Yeah, these little filters are made from the same mixture as the large filters. They're just on a smaller scale. You see in the back on that table, we, we made some mini filters yesterday. We still have some clay and sawdust. We can make some more today if you want. Um, the, um, they, would, these, this, they would need to be tested, right, to make sure that they have the proper, proper flow rate. Um, but the other thing is you'd have to, we have to make sure that the water that is there, that these filters would filter out the bad stuff in the water that's there. Okay. So, you know, I'm happy to make some small filters if you'd like to take some with you. Um, and you'd have to see, but you also need to take some test kits. And I have some small um, test kits. If I don't have them here, I have them. We can, I can get them. We can get them to you. Yeah. Um, but the idea is that to, to, you need to test the water. It's, it's, it would be equally irresponsible, say, oh, here's something that can be, you know, to take with you, and, and it doesn't work. So um, we have to figure out what's in the water. And that's the basis for setting up the filter facilities. But the idea of being able to take some of these in your backpack and on your carry-on and being able to distribute and have immediate response, 
that's, that's a big deal. And so, you know, what you're up to and, what, and the work that you're going to be doing, you know, uh, is, is very important. Um, there's a, another, but these things are fragile too. Mm -hmm. So the packing that it would take would require taking up some space as well. So there's always give and take, push and pull. One, I was met, talking to someone yesterday uh, about a very similar part of the conversation. And uh, one of the things we started to do when I was at Texas A&M before I came to uh, Penn State, before I moved to Penn State, was revolving around this very thing. And we thought, you know what? May I borrow your bottle for just a second? This opening is about the same size as larger bottles. Um, I don't have one here. It's so, you know, like a liter bottle. What if we turned it over and you cut it right here, or you cut it just enough that you could have a little flap, right? And then what if we took the same material and instead of what some folks are doing with making discs, look, they look like hockey pucks, right? That you can put inside PVC piping. What if we made little corks? They look like little wine corks, but it's made out of this material that could fit into this bottle. So you lift the hinge, you put the cork down there, and then we have our own little portable receptacle. So it would take this bottle that then gets discarded, that creates waste. Maybe it becomes a repurposed individual. How many corks could you, yeah, you're just creating cork. How many wine corks could you take in your backpack? Yeah. Hundreds, mm -hmm. right? So it's that notion of scale and responsibility and access and immediacy. Maybe after, you know, a couple of weeks, or maybe in this case, unfortunately, a couple of months, the, 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 uh, you w there would not be that need, and you'd have ways to deal with the recycling. But at any rate, what you're talking about is, is a very important um, uh, issue instead of concerns. I first became familiar with the term creative disruption um, from uh, David Dartz, who was an art educator. Uh, and and his, his doctoral <coughs> dissertation and, and work looking at um, the practice of, of culture jamming, uh, which grows out of um, an, an entire practice of uh, uh, responding to capitalism and uh, uh, advertising. Uh, so David um, looked at this idea of visual culture jamming, where you add, uh, instead of looking at culture specific, broadly cult visual culture more specifically, and the way um, one might look at um, the visual components of a culture differently through some sort of what he called creative disruption. Um, creative meaning, you know, to pr in, in, come, in his sense, coming from an artistic or, or cultural production perspective. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, you can be disruptive. Um, uh, one might argue, you know, any kind of disruption is, is creative, but certainly the creative in this sense comes from a more uh, generic notion of, of artistic uh, or, or cultural production. Yeah, how many decades ago, approximately, was it? About one. Okay. <laughs> one. No, no, yes, it's only, but the term is about 15, 20 years old, in, in the sense that I, I understand it to be. It's, very, it's, it's been a very popular term in business management. Mm -hmm. at Harvard Business School, that I've been teaching courses in creative disruption as a strategy for entrepreneurship. So if you want to take on the big companies, mm -hmm you need to do something that disrupts the whole logic mm -hmm. of how that, whatever that service or product is, is organized and presented. Part of the work that I do uh, at um, my current university and previous universities in uh, art education is to prepare teachers, pr to prepare teachers of art, um, but even uh, K-12 uh, K teachers. Um, and so w with that preparation, there are, there are, there are courses, uh, method, methods courses or curriculum development courses um, that essentially are structured to respond in, in many ways to very specific skills or content. Right? And that's all fine and good, uh, except um, you know, what I find more interesting are the, the, the questions that emerge and, and that, that can be uh, center points for, for curriculum. So instead of think of curriculum development as, as, and, and management, it's the idea of, of theorizing curriculum. So spinning it around in terms of um, uh, the questioning, uh, most teacher preparation um, programs that I'm familiar with, um, because there are the, the, these standards and, and, and points for accreditation, uh, students must meet specific responses. And they're pretty rigid, those, those curricula. Um, but um, I, I think that there are ways to play in and around. I've, I've worked 
this way for a while, um, around the, by, by, by still responding to those um, expectations um, for certification, but at the same time, open it up so that teachers become uh, knowledgeable and prepared and have experience um, to uh, have an ongoing uh, engagement with, 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 with learning and developing interesting and exciting curriculum that responds to social practices. For example, um, um, the idea of focusing on a theme or a concept or a question rather than on a specific outcome or skill, just making that shift is a big challenge for a lot of teacher preparation programs because what you're doing is you're essentially saying the, the predetermined content that we have and the predetermined skills that we have is not all there is to our discipline, that there could be more to it. And it also suggests that it's not really the, 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 the idea of learning that's important in education. It's about teaching content. So I like to turn also the shift to, from t teaching to learning, to making the project about learning. Now, um, and so this is how, how I'm going about it myself, Larry, working with um, undergrads and grad students to put questions at the center of their curriculum. So it becomes an inquiry-based uh, approach, or it becomes um, a thematic approach. And often it's inspired by, by social issues. I can show you um, an example or two, if you'd like, and specifically to water. So one of the things that I've enjoyed doing is using... Um, you know, we've had uh, back and forth, uh, Larry, about, uh, you know, access to education in broad spaces um, online is, is one way that that happens. So MindMeister is a free um, application. And some of my early work in curriculum theorizing and, and, and development uh, looked at hypertext, uh, spatial hypertext. So what if you took a concept, like, and more than a concept, I mean, you know, water is a, is, is a, is a broad idea. Big. So what if we put water at the center here? And what I did was I said, look, I uh, had, had a group of students. We said, if we put water at the center, what are the ideas and questions and concepts that emerge from just us thinking about water? So there might be technology concerns. There are issues related to pollution. There are uh, contemporary artists who are looking at and thinking about water. There are, there's information then at the next level. Uh, th that relates to our understandings of water. And so what you're seeing here is an interconnected web of information inspired by the simple notion of water. What if you as a teacher, as, as a, you can be a teacher, you can be an artist, you can be whatever, what does art, art, water make you think of? What questions emerge? What do you know about water? What are you curious about, about water? If you start curriculum in that place, what do you know? What don't you know? What would be interesting to know? And you go off in these various dimensions and you start to learn along, your, along the way and you're not doing it by yourself. You're learning with a group of people. So everyone in class has access to this web. Everyone in class over the series of days that we're working on this can see how it, it continues to be populated. And we all have access to everybody else's information. This is a curriculum right here of water that could be navigated, that could be, you know, you could select certain components of it. And again, I'm not showing you all of the details, but you could select certain components of it, highlight those components. There might be some key questions. You might like some of the things that one person looked at. All right, so here are some issues about pollution, sanitation, and, and civilizations. This, curric this piece also allows us to put embedded video and, and, and other content. So the idea would be if the preparation of teachers, or the work that teachers do as they prepare to be certified and licensed, moves away, in my view, from only focusing on discipline content, only on discipline skills, but privileges the questioning and, and the nurturing of inquiry and learning. I think what we have is, is we have a different sensibility. You have teachers who aren't limited by their own disciplines and are seeking uh, ways to make those, those connections. And in doing that, a curriculum that, that, that comes from this mode of development can then respond to any state or local standards of learning, any national curriculum uh, concerns.
The example I want to show you, um, this is, uh, have you ever been to an, um, an elementary uh, art exhibit and you see like all of the images are, look very similar, you see like, you know, all the paintings and their drawings, whatever. Um, rarely do we see art criticism, Rare, rarely, rarely do you see young children's art historical papers on display, it happens every once in a while. This is a, a water filter display at the Chesterfield, uh, Chesterfield County Exhibition. So this is just one teacher, uh, Sean Collins, did this. And so he used the water filters as part of his curriculum, but also as part of the art exhibition. He got comments from teachers like, wow, what? How does this, the, the art? This is part of your art curriculum? Well, yeah, why, why not? This is what we're doing. And he linked it to Greek vases, and he linked it to um, you know, expressionist painting. He linked it to all sorts of other components. But by making the art uh, curriculum or, or the space in which an artist might think inclusive of appropriate technology and social issues and social responsibility. That's a disruption right there. So can elementary kids do it? Absolutely they can. This is a page from the Reservoir Studio including names of the, the art teachers who have agreed to work with me or found interest or that have invited me to do water filter performances but also work on curricula with them. And uh, this list keeps growing. I haven't updated yet, but I have, I have several others who have been interested. Here's a person who came to a conference, curriculum conference, Denise Gordon. She was a science educator in Texas. She came to this curriculum and pedagogy conference, and instead of presenting a paper on the water filters, my colleague, my mentor, Richard Wukic, and I, we set up a water filter production facility, and we made filters as our conference presentation. And so people coming and expecting to see a paper presented, they helped me sieve sawdust and <laughs> we made the filters. The reason I'm telling you that is because Denise Gordon showed up to that presentation. And she said, I am a science teacher, but I think in these interdisciplinary ways and I like these experiential hands-on approaches. And so I sent her four filters, mini filters, at her request, two that had silver on, in, embedded in them and two that did not, and her advanced um, uh, science students, middle school students, did tests on those water filters. They tested the water from two local sources. They did research on the production of the filters and they set up, um, they, they found other commercial filters and they, they ran their results and they found that the, these little filters worked as well or better than those commercial filters on two different sources of water. One was I think um, uh, the local river and the other was some other sewage uh, space. But my, my point is that she empowered her students to take control and to, and to lead the inquiry. And this is middle school, so can middle school students think in these ways and consider their place in the world and their responsibility? Absolutely, and again, these are just two of many possible um, um, ways that this might happen, but just, just responding specifically to, um, to that question. How do you place a disruptive uh, way of doing things and incremental way of doing a thing? Probably uh, what is existing, taking it ahead, and improving on it, maybe called incremental mm -hmm. and disruptive, where you put a full stop and start with something new. In fact, ceramic filter itself, I don't know whether to call it disruptive because a filter existed and it was modified in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm really confused about these definitions sure. about disruptive, incremental, what is it? And how do you go back, especially in terms of disasters, uh, where I think the need is to go back to basics. For me, disruption is incremental. It's a process. It's a it's a verb in my 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 thinking. Um, certainly, one can disrupt with a sp specific action, and it seems like it's only happening in that moment. But we can think more broadly that once that moment happens, there's there are continuing um, um, echoes from that. So I I think uh, it al it's also um, site specific to um, the degree of incremental change or disruption that happens. But I don't. I'm not thinking about disruption necessarily as, as one specific moment. I, I think of it in a longer term, in a moving, time-based way. Um, I, uh, so that's one part of your question. I think a second part had to do with the filters and seeing them as disruptive. Um, and certainly for folks who didn't have a adequate access to clean water and now they might have access, the filters have disrupted that previous narrative of inaccessibility and have disrupted a long-standing, a generational experience with being sick and, and, and having disease, right? So, so it's disrupting that, that health issue and that human issue. Um, 
And, and, and so there's that. And, and then going back to basic, ab absolutely. I mean, you, you do what you need to do. And certainly, um, uh, you know, the water's coming down. Let's get some plastic and, and collect the water. I mean, that, that seems like the most appropriate technology that we've talked about today, Could right? I think your examples are, are, are right on. The, the, uh, right on. And I, I hope it clarified a little bit how I'm thinking about disruption, not as, and I didn't, didn't clarify disruption for me, it's not a, a moment, but it's an ongoing. It's a continuum. It's a, it's a continuum, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and it's very. It was my job, to, I mean, it's a job for us to do that. So whether it's disruptive or not disruptive, my job is to provide clean water to people out yeah. there. And that's what I'm doing. Sure. So whether it is disruptive or not. It's that simple. Well, yeah, it, it is. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think sometimes I, 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 I like to be a bit more dramatic maybe than, than necessary. <laughs> but certainly, but, and, and to think more broadly um, or differently, um, you know, folks didn't have the water yeah. and you allow water to be available, you disrupted their, their lack of access. So I think I did my job. You did your yeah. job.